Dear students, let us start the discussion on today's newspaper that is 7th November 2016. The first article, it is related to the discussion on India's foreign policy and perspectives of India's foreign policy. So let's understand something over here. In recent days, there is a change in our perspective. The more strategic vision is being replaced by the tactical action. And the second thing is, the consensus, intellectuality is replaced with more and more bureaucratization in the policy element. So now, how we shall fight this? The first thing is, India is economically powerful now and its growth rate is highest in the world. So it has to convert that into diplomacy. It has to gain from the diplomacy leveraging it as um, an important tool for India. So but however, India is getting fixated itself into South Asian uh, geopolitical web. Now if you see, USA it wants to hyphenate China with India. Now, China wants to hyphenate India with Pakistan. This is the strategic interest of China. If you take the NSG meeting, China tried to hyphenate India and Pakistan together. So, in this case, India wants to expand its geopolitical horizon and play a greater stage on the international arena. But however, China wants to confine India to South Asian politics. So, India by focusing itself more and more on terrorism, especially Pak-sponsored terrorism, it is getting confined to South Asia. So in the South Asia itself, it is trying to look into these issues. If you see the economic and political might of China, after one belt, one road initiative and a series of infrastructure projects it has taken up in China, sorry, uh, in Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, if we observe them. So there is definitely rising influence of China in the Indian Ocean region. So India has to take a greater long-term strategic view how it shall stabilize its own neighborhood and then expand into the horizons on the other side. That is the first thing. The second thing is Indian foreign policy getting fixated on terrorism. So in this terrorism, the Pakistan is more shown as a seed for terrorism. So the Indian strategy has shifted in such a way that um, the Balochistan is being highlighted in the Prime Minister's Independence Day speech. So he wanted to hit the two birds, Pakistan and China through the Balochistan. So here, did it move the focus of Indian diplomacy is the question. India already suffers from the lack of sufficient diplomatic corps and using these scarce resources towards engaging them on Balochistan and other non-priority areas for India, how good it is in its long-term interest. And then the terror-focused policy also highlighted Pak-sponsored terrorism in Kashmir. So it is going very much against the India's long-term interest, let us see. India never wanted to internationalize the Kashmiri issue. By bringing the Kashmiri terrorism or terrorism in the Kashmir, by saying it as Pak-sponsored terrorism, and Pakistan in, uh, in return accusing India as sponsoring the terrorism in Balochistan, a kind of a parity is being brought in between Kashmir and Balochistan, and where the human rights are being, violations are being exposed to the international community in both the regions. And India's track record is much better than Pakistan with regard to the Kashmir is concerned. But however, they are getting hyphenated and equated with each other, which is not good within the India's long-term interests. And the second thing is, either you take the BRICS summit, East Asia summit, and G20, everywhere we started talking only about the terrorism. So it means the valuable time of our political leadership is not being used for economic benefit or economic prosperity of the nation rather than it getting diverted by the terror and terrorism. And yes, it may serve the current regime's political needs. 
does it serve the national interest is the major question and the second thing is masood azhar issue if you observe india wanted to declare him as an international terrorist and china did not buy india's argument and india developed a binary if you hate pakistan you can be the friend of india because of this binary the china and india's distance is increasing so it may destabilize the entire region and it is not good for a progress of a nation such as india which is at the crossroads now and the third thing is the alliances so indian alliances they are previously uh, progressed around strategic autonomy today they are getting aligned or multi alignment has been getting replaced uh, the non alignment in this multi alignment india wants to balance russia on one side us on the other side but however signing of the agreement such as lemova which brings russia us and india close together militarily obviously has increased the distance between russia and india russia is trying to balance this with pakistan and as us is losing its global significance this balance between russia and usa appears to be not a right strategy according to this particular article so in this context what is the root cause of the problem one is bureaucratization of the foreign policy previously specialists who are the academicians in the foreign policy who can see long term vision into the foreign policy they were engaged now the prime minister's office is dominating the foreign policy and it was totally into the hands of the bureaucracy and the second thing is consensus among the political party so the national security is getting seen from a very narrow lens of uh, the political priorities so the political parties can be engaged and a consensus approach has to be brought in on what shall consist of the national security doctrine existence of this national security doctrine it brings in a collective action towards the foreign policy so these are the two things specialization of the foreign policy bringing in a national security doctrine through consensus uh, it can improve the foreign policy imperatives for india and looking for a humane solution what is this related to now india sri lanka fish, uh, fisherman problem so if you take uh, indian uh, as tamil nadu fishermen they are crossing the international waters and entering into the sri lankan waters and collecting the fish from there these pop- people are using modern trawlers and these are also re- resorting to bottom trawling so what is meant by bottom trawling the surface of the uh, i mean sea or the river it is been washed out in this bottom trawling and the surface is a breeding ground for the fishes if the bottom is wiped out then obviously the future population of the fish over there is going to get deteriorated so use of this bottom trawling and then excessive fishing through modern trawlers on the coastal waters in sri lanka is threatening the livelihoods of the sri lankan population especially the tamil population of the northern provinces from jaffna now in this case the tamil nadu people these have to be issued are provided with an alternative employment india do not have the sufficient technology with regard to the high sea fishing so what india has to do it has to develop the technology for the fishing in the high seas and the next one is in this case a joint working group is created and indian side is demanding that this trawling has to be ended progressively over 3 years but however sri lanka has opposed to that by the time the economy and ecology both gets devastated and a joint working group is constituted for this purpose and also the ministers for fish or fisheries ministries they are going to meet once in 6 months and the people who are been arrested they will be released immediately no navy will be firing on these fishermen who cross the international waters these are the certain agreements which are been reached between india and sri lanka 
back from the brink in Lebanon. So now let us see this. So with regard to Lebanon, there is a very complex power sharing agreement. So what is this? In Lebanon, we have three groups. One is Christians, Sunnis and Shias. Now, the presidential post shall go to the Christians. Sunnis shall get the prime ministerial post. Shias shall get the speaker. So in this case, the Shias and Sunnis, they have always uh, are conflicting with each other. And international mechanisms further worsened the situation. So now, the Shias are backed by Iran. Sunnis are backed by Saudi Arabia. The Cold War in the Middle East is worsening the situation in Lebanon. So in this case, the Iran supported Hezbollah is also active in uh, uh, Palestine and also in Syria. And in these circumstances, Michael Avon is appointed as the president of uh, Lebanon, who is a Christian. And Rafi Karari and Nasrullah, they reach to an agreement, which is a welcome sign over here. Now, let's get into the next page, that is the perspective page. Now, Obama's tricky legacy. Now, let us see how US-Russia relations are. Now, Obama has inherited a tricky position in the Russia. And US was also involved with wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. That was the legacy given by George Bush to President Obama. So, when US has attacked on Iraq, on the pretext of disposing the weapons of mass destruction, has weakened its moral fabric. So it means it was unable to question any such action by Russia. And US also got preoccupied itself with various military interventions. And it was unable to focus on Russia's aggression in its neighborhood. And Russia believes that the Central Asian countries are its sphere of influence. So there is a dictum in Russia the only way to defend its country is, um, is to expand its boundaries. That was the dictum in Russia. So in this case, during Bush era, Russian influence was, ex was uh, planned to be cut down. So US wanted to cut the Russia to size. For that, it has taken up two important uh, actions. One is deploying the missile defense systems in surrounding nations around Russia. It means it weakens the strategic balance between Russia and USA. Here we have to understand, there is mutually issued destruction that maintains the strategic balance. If you kill me, I have the power to kill you. So now, as missile defense systems will be in, uh, are installed in Russia and uh, surrounding the Russia, Obviously, Russia's second strike ability going to come down. And the second thing which the Bush did is, they have brought up a series of revolutions in the Russian surrounding nations, which Russia considers as its sphere of influence. So in this, Georgia is one important thing. So in this Georgia, Michael Sarkis will be, he has agreed to participate and become the member of NATO. And he withdrew himself from Commonwealth of Independent States, which was promoted by Russia. Then, the Georgia's open heel or open wound was Abkhazia and South Ossetia. North Ossetia was the part of Russian Federation. South Ossetia was the part of Georgia. An independence movement was going on these, in these two areas. Russia supported the independence movement saying that uh, the population of the South Ossetia and Abkhazia are the Russian citizens and it has to protect the Russian citizens uh, and it has militarily intervened in these areas and got, got hold of uh, these two areas and recognized the independence of these two regions from Georgia. In that way, the first military interventionism went into uh, the Georgia. Now, the same story got repeated after a few years. That is with Ukraine. Ukraine also showed its willingness to join the NATO. 
and added to the western forces they wanted to bring down viktor anukovych who was russian friendly president of ukraine and then a puppet regime was placed in ukraine and the bleeding spot for the ukraine was crimea and russia annexed crimea and conducted a referendum there so in these circumstances the plan appears to be simple and straight for russia so but us how it has to respond and how it has responded what are the choices before them us could have militarily intervened in georgia and ukraine but however the nato has been preoccupied with other engagements and it was unable to intervene militarily and it was don't want to escalate the confrontation which can slip out of the hands very soon so that's why non military intervention was the choice for these for them so it has led a message to mr putin that uh, these western powers are not in a position to engage the russia so in this case the syrian war has come up and it has proven the russia stand to be right um, and the assad has to remain in power to maintain the stability of the syrian state on the other hand western side argued for the syrian existing state structure shall be abolished and assad shall go so in this scenario finally the russia support has led to strengthening of the assad and us and west has supported for the the rebel forces which whose power is slowly weakening so it means if you take the story of georgia ukraine and syria these three helped russia for its resurgence and added to that russia is also developing close relations with china so this russia china axis it is going to weaken the power of the united states of america so that's why a cold war has already started cold war 2 we can call it as between russia and usa when obama came to power he has initiated a new start treaty strategic armed uh, strategic arms reduction treaty to reduce the nuclear weapons we do not know what is its status now when hillary was the secretary of state she has initiated this famous reset in russia and us ties and uh, this has been highly derailed now that is what is the situation which we are seeing now now when the screen goes blank let us see this issue now ndtv it was banned to telecast its news for 24 hours on the pretext that it has violated the cable television networks amendment rules of 2015 according to section 61p the news channel shall not um, uh telecast any information any sensitive information that derail the military operations and the second thing is it shall confine itself to the briefings given by the representative of the government so in this case understand the media shall have an objective analysis a right to question so in this case the supreme court has laid a standard that any censorship by the government on the media is not in the spirit of the democracy and the second thing is if you take the shreya singhal versus union of india case the supreme court has clearly said any subtle way of imposing the restrictions on article 19 1a will have a chilling effect on the functioning of our democracy and with chintamani the court supreme court is the only institution that in, that can interpret the reasonable uh, restrictions imposed through article 19 sub clause 2 it means uh, the scope of article 19 sub clause 2 that allows for the imposition of the reasonable restrictions uh, on the freedom of speech and expression can only be by the supervision of the supreme court uh. now if you see this uh, it appears the government has faulted on two things one is it has failed to give regulation to the bodies consisting of media or through indi- or through independent bodies so instead of that it resorted to governmental regulation so the self regulation or independent regulation is being replaced by governmental regulation that is the first thing and the second thing is 
if we carefully observe the supreme court is the protector of the rights of the people it has to safeguard the fundamental rights of the people and protection of the press freedom of press is also integral to article 19 1a and 19 1g so both of these need to be protected by the supreme court uh, and any government intervention is naturally expected towards a judicial intervention so these are the two things now coming to delhi the delhi is becoming a gas chamber now i generally say that it was always a gas chamber the intensity is varying so what are the reasons for this the major thing according to me is vehicular population in new delhi and the second thing is there is a thermal power plant close to delhi and the third thing is the construction work which is going on fourth is the burning of the crop residues in the surrounding states these are the reasons for the formation of the thick smog that is smoke plus fog is the thick smog and it is going to economically hit the capital so the right to clean air that shall be the fundamental right of the citizens and citizens are agitating against it are ag- agitating against the prevailing situation in delhi let us see how the supreme court responds to it the matter went to the hands of the supreme court now now let us see india to raise the work permit issue with canada and uk in the business paper now here we have to understand what are the mode four services it is free movement of the skilled manpower between the countries so united states if you talk about h1 visas and l1 visas these are meant for mode four movement but europe and canada they have too many restrictions on this mode four movement if a service trade has to enlarge between the countries this mode four movement is very critical but however this mode four movement has its own challenges one is the disruption of the local employment so for that purpose the canada it has local employment impact assessment so it means any of the visa norms to be relaxed or any visa application to be processed it also has to go through the labor department and labor department sees it in a negative sense and most of the cases these applications are rejected and uk it has tightened its visa norms recently so that is the reason why how the mode four services will be revisited will depend upon the expansion of the trade in goods and services between these countries so these are the articles for today thank you very much and all the best